What's up everyone, Pritch here, bringing you a guide on everything Void Gauntlet and New World. First, we'll go over basic and heavy attacks. Second, we'll go over all the weapon abilities, upgrades, and passives that can be specced into you for both the Annihilation and Decay trait lines. Finally, we're going to cover potential builds and fun weapon combos to try out. I'm giving you guys a fair heads up right now. There are a ton of mechanics and lines of text with the Void Gauntlet, so this is going to be a longer video. Without further ado, let's dive into the Void. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the first big power creep introduced into New World, the Void Gauntlet. The Void Gauntlet scales off intelligence, so the more damage you want to do, the smarter you have to be. The Void Gauntlet has secondary scaling off of focus, and it has some abilities that pretend to scale exclusively off of it. Before hopping into the basic attacks, I want to give a quick heads up about the numbers you're going to be seeing. The vast majority of the footage is with no attribute points and 30 intelligence from the Void Gauntlet, but occasionally I put points into intelligence or focus to showcase some of the healing effects with larger numbers. So when you see drastic spikes in numbers, it's because I have 195 focus or 225 intelligence. With that, let's dive into your auto attacks. For your light attacks, whip that glove back and forth like you're playing front hand backhand and throw out a projectile that deals 100% weapon damage. For your heavy attacks, do the exact same animation but longer for 125% weapon damage and heal yourself for 20% of the damage done. Finally, the Void Gauntlet has a very special and unique blocking mechanic called Harvest Essence. While holding block, drain your own health to replenish mana and the rate scales with your weapon damage. This is going to come in handy later because all the Void Gauntlet abilities are very mana intensive. And don't worry, Harvest Essence can't be used to kill yourself. It'll stop when your health gets too low. Next, let's dive into the trait line that's quite literally doing everything in the game, Annihilation. The first weapon ability is Void Blade. Become Cassadin from League and gain a melee Void Blade for 15 seconds that will change your auto attacks and blocks. Your new basic attacks are a 3 auto attack chain and each attack deals 100% weapon damage. Your new heavy attacks are a charged up hit where you lunge forward about 5 meters dealing 150% weapon damage. Also, while holding a blade, you actually block instead of doing Harvest Essence. With your new blade, you also have guaranteed bat crits on any melee swing. The blade lasts for 15 seconds, costs 20 mana, and has a 25 second cooldown, but the cooldown is initiated the moment you summon the sword, so there's really only 10 seconds of downtime. Now for the real kicker. Each attack with Void Blade applies a debuff called Disintegrate. Disintegrate does two things. First, it deals 5% weapon damage over 8 seconds for a total of 40% weapon damage. Second, it applies a 5% rend for 8 seconds. Disintegrate can stack up to 3 times, which means that with 3 autos, you can apply a 15% rend for 8 seconds and deal an additional 120% weapon damage over 8 seconds. Unlike other stacking debuffs in New World, Disintegrate stacks remain independent and applying a new stack will not reset the previous stacks to 8 seconds. You will see multiple stacks be applied, but each one will fall off exactly 8 seconds after they are individually applied. Small tip for those that didn't know, rend applications do affect damage over time, which means that each stack of Disintegrate literally buffs its own damage over time. Two big things about the rend application from Disintegrate. First, Disintegrate is its own unique debuff, which means that it will stack with any and all rend applications. Second, in New World, the maximum amount of rend that any target can have is 30%, and combining Disintegrate with any other rends will not let you go over that 30%, so you're not going to be able to exceed that cap. Overall, this sword can pump out so much damage so fast that you basically just want to spam it whenever possible. The first upgrade is Fortified Blade. When summoning the blade, gain a 20% Fortify for 5 seconds. The second upgrade is Vicious Void. Gain 10% crit damage on your Void Blade hits. The third and final upgrade is Leeching Blade. Your heavy Void Blade attacks heal yourself for 5% per Disintegrate stack, which means that you can max at 15% lifesteal with 3 Disintegrate stacks. Alright. Now, we're one ability in, and we have our first example of a Void Gauntlet tooltip saying that the healing scales exclusively with focus. That's absolute bogus, and Amazon is lying to you, which baffles me because there was absolutely no reason to put that sentence in any of the tooltips. The truth is that your healing scales exclusively off your weapon damage. 
And your weapon damage has primary scaling off intelligence and secondary off of focus. To prove this, I'm going to show you the results of the healing values I received from three different tests. Test number one had no attribute points spent, just the 30 base intelligence from the Void Gauntlet itself. Test two had 195 focus and it did absolutely increase the healing, but only because more focus means more Void Gauntlet weapon damage. Test 3 had a total of 220 intelligence, and this is where we exposed the giant lie, because this gave me the highest healing values because it was increasing my weapon damage the most. If healing scaled exclusively off of focus, my test 3 values should have been the exact same as my test 1 values. So the simple lesson that I've proven is that any future Void Gauntlet tooltip that states that healing scales exclusively off of focus is just wrong. They all scale exclusively off of weapon damage. The next weapon ability is Oblivion. Reach into the ground and pull out a circle of death with a 5 meter radius that does two things for six seconds. First, it grants yourself and all allies standing on your void circle a 20% empower. Second, it damages enemies standing on the circle for 30% weapon damage each second for a total of 180% weapon damage over 6 seconds. Oblivion costs 30 mana and sits on a 20 second cooldown which initiates on cast which means it really only has a 14 second cooldown. Overall, the ability to provide a huge empower buff to any ally you cast under is incredibly powerful and provides insane team utility. We're only two abilities deep, but it's time to showcase the second biggest bug in the video, and that has to deal with the interaction between Oblivion and Voidblade. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Slip and Slide. Before the slip and slide, the longest dash in the game was the Fire Staff's Burnout, which was a 15 meter dash. The slip and slide is a 20 meter dash that utilizes the heavy attack on Void Blade plus Oblivion. Simply charge your heavy attack and release, then while you're in your heavy thrust animation, drop Oblivion and slide 20 meters. We're going to talk about how this Void Gauntlet kit has a huge weakness in that it has no escapability mechanics to get away from when being focused, but this slip and slide not only nullifies the only built in weakness, but gives Void Gauntlet the biggest dash in the game now. Also, yes, you can slip and slide out of a gravity well. Now I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I didn't find this myself. My boy Bear Dog did, and he's another content creator, so I'm going to put his link in my description, and I want you guys to go show him a little love for his big brain. The first upgrade is Withering Oblivion. Any enemy inside your Oblivion that you hit will receive a 5% weaken that lasts for 5 seconds, and this can stack up to 3 times for a 15% weaken. These weaken stacks count as individual timers, and those timers do not reset on a new application. The second upgrade is Invigorating Oblivion. You and any ally inside your Oblivion gain 15 stamina per second, and you're going to gain that stamina even if you reach 0 and the bar has been grayed out. The final weapon ability is Petrifying Scream. Scream at your enemies as if they're Amazon trying to drop a new world patch and deal 100% weapon damage to anyone 5 meters in front of you. Anyone hit will get staggered and then rooted for 2 seconds. This costs 25 mana and sits on a 15 second cooldown. Just be aware, you also root yourself for about 1 second while screaming, so don't scream in unsafe places like dark alleys or global chat. The first upgrade is Bone Chilling Voice. Enemies below 50% health get rooted for 3 seconds instead of 2 seconds. This is now tied with musket traps for the longest route in the game, except this can now hit multiple targets. The second upgrade is Fortifying Echoes. Gain a 10% fortify that lasts for 10 seconds for each enemy hit, which maxes out at 3 stacks for a 30% fortify for 10 seconds. A 30% fortify is one of the largest damage reductions in the game, but the scream is pretty narrow, so hitting 3 targets isn't the easiest task. Abilities done, let's hop into the passives. First up, Forsaken Pact. Deal 10% more damage when your mana is below 50%, and since all your abilities guzzle your mana up, it's extremely common to be under 50% mana. Next, Keen Confidence. Gain 10% crit chance while above 50% health. Keen Humility. Gain 10% crit chance when all your Void Gauntlet abilities are on cooldown. Refreshing Precision. Gain 10% cooldown reduction on crit. And remember, Void Blade always bat crits. Empowering Proximity. Gain a 10% empower that lasts for 5 seconds when you cast an ability and an enemy is within 5 meters of you. 
This can be stacked three times for a 30% in power, but frankly, I think this tooltip is super misleading because originally, I thought I could cast one ability with three enemies nearby and I could instantly get my three stacks of empower because I thought I gained a stack for each nearby enemy. No, you can only gain a maximum of one stack per ability cast no matter how many enemies are around you. So the only way to get three stacks is to cast all three abilities near an enemy. Also, as is the case with basically all Void Gauntlet buffs and debuffs, these empowers are on a different timer, so a new empower application will not reset the previous stack to 5. Efficient Harvest While mana is below 25%, Harvest Essence, which is your blocking mechanic, reduces 50% less health when converting your health into mana. Since at a base level you convert 17 to 18 mana per tick, at best, this will only apply to two ticks of Harvest Essence, but normally only one tick. Leeching Agony On crit, get 15% lifesteal, and remember, you can already get another 15% lifesteal with Void Blade, which has guaranteed back crits, so you could rock 30% lifesteal off of two traits when back critting with a Void Blade. Refreshing Frailty Get 5% cooldown reduction when hitting an enemy that has 3 or more debuffs on them, and they can be from different debuffs. Whoever was tasked with coding this ability had the balls to say no, and simply didn't do it. Then, when the manager was asked to double check the work, he also had the balls to give the middle finger and say no. So solid work all around, Jerry1 and Jerry2. Finally, we have the Annihilation Elite Void Caller. When you hit an enemy with an ability, gain a stack of Void Essence. Once you get to 6 stacks, Void Caller will activate and create a circle that has a 3 meter radius and lasts for 5 seconds. This circle does two things. First, it damages enemies inside by 30% weapon damage for a total of 150% weapon damage over 5 seconds. Second, it heals allies inside by 30% weapon damage for a total of 150% weapon damage over 5 seconds. This has an internal cooldown of 20 seconds and tries to lie by saying it scales exclusively off of focus, but you can ignore that because it scales off your weapon damage. Some notes about the stacks. Stacks last for 10 seconds and each new application resets the timer on the previous applications. If you hit multiple enemies with the same ability, you will gain multiple stacks. Void Blade auto attacks do count and will give you stacks. Oblivion Ticks on the other hand do not count and will not give you stacks. This hopefully comes as no surprise, but this elite had an incredibly ridiculous bug, and the bug is much more prevalent with the next elite, so I'm going to cover it on that one, but just keep your eyes peeled. That wraps up the Annihilation Tree. To recap, you can gain a Void Blade that turns your attacks into melee hits, you can AoE buff all your allies damage, you can root enemies, you can reach stupid high levels of lifesteal, you can combine blade with oblivion for a 20 meter dash, and your elite gives you a circle of death and healing all at the same time. Alright everybody, mid round break, and I just want to be honest and frank, I'm sorry that this video is so late in its making, this should have been out probably a month ago. Um, I, I definitely got pretty demotivated when I saw the direction Amazon was starting to drive New World into. Um, and I'm sorry for that. That shouldn't, that should never be something that affects the content I'm putting out and the stuff I'm doing for you guys. So I just want you guys to know I'm, I'm focusing hard on YouTube now and you can expect a lot of big things coming in early 2022. I promise you that. Uh, I'm back grinding YouTube and I'm ready to make some fun stuff for you guys and I hope you guys are along for the ride. All right, let's hop right into the decay tree. The second trait line centers around buffing and debuffing, just like the Annihilation Tree, but this time, it's called Decay. The first weapon ability is called Orb of Decay, and holy cow, is there a lot packed into this one ability. Shoot an orb that travels 20 meters out. While traveling out, any enemy struck will take 100% weapon damage and gain a stack of Disintegrate, which is the debuff that deals 5% weapon damage per second and applies a 5% rend, and all of this lasts for 8 seconds. Then, once the orb has traveled 20 meters, it will do a 180 and come right back the way it came, but have a completely different effect. While traveling back, any ally hit with the orb will receive a stack of regen that heals for 20% weapon damage and lasts for 5 seconds for a total of 100% weapon damage. This all sits on a 15 second cooldown and costs 20 mana. 
as always, completely ignore the healing skills exclusively with focus crap because it's as truthful as Into the Void's patch notes. Some fun notes about the orb. This bad boy is unblockable and is not considered a projectile, so not even Maelstrom is stopping this orb. The orb will travel out 20 meters in front of you or until it hits a solid object like a wall, rock, or ground. Once it makes contact with something, it will travel in the opposite direction from impact for exactly 20 meters. And this has some fun implications. I stood 5 meters from a gate and had a buddy stand 15 meters behind me, which means that he was 20 meters from the gate. I then fired my orb directly at the gate, and instead of going out 20 meters and then coming back 20 meters to me, the orb went out 5 meters to the gate, then hit the gate and stopped, then it traveled 20 meters back in the opposite direction and hit my buddy with the regen who was standing 15 meters behind me. Another fun bouncing trick is that if you stand slightly off ground level and look down, then shoot the orb, it'll bounce back straight up out of the ground for the healing. I can't think of any practical use for this, I just think it's really funny to see the orb shooting straight up out of the ground. The first upgrade is Draining Orb. Get 5% mana for each enemy you hit, which means that if you hit 4 enemies, then you've already refunded the entire cost of the ability. The second upgrade is Slowing Orb. If you hit a debuffed enemy, they will receive a 30% slow for 3 seconds, and this upgrade is why all bruisers in wars are basically permaslowed. The third upgrade is Detonating Orb. While the orb is traveling, you can detonate the orb for a 4 meter radius, and the detonation will have different effects depending on when you detonate. If you blow up the orb while it's traveling out, it'll deal 100% weapon damage and apply a disintegrate stack. If you blow up the orb while it's traveling back, it'll instantly heal allies for 70% weapon damage. Both orb effects will stack with their non-detonation effects. So, on the way out, you could hit an enemy and deal 100% weapon damage. Then, you could detonate and hit the same enemy with another 100% weapon damage and apply a second disintegrate stack. In the same way, on the way back, you can hit an ally and apply a 20% heal over time, then detonate and heal the same ally for an instant 70% health. Now previously, this detonation would always bat crit on enemies for solid damage, but in the December patch, Amazon is getting rid of this. Or at least they say they are. As always, ignore the lies of Amazon, the healing scales off weapon damage, not focus. The next weapon ability is Baleful Tether. Shoot a tether into your enemy that lasts for 10 seconds. The tether does two things at the exact same time. Your enemy gets weakened and you get empowered by 4%, but both the weaken and empower get capped at 20%. So after 5 seconds, you will have a 20% empower and your opponent will have a 20% weaken. To put that in simple terms, you now have a 40% damage advantage for the next 5 seconds. This tether costs 25 mana and has a 25 second cooldown, but the cooldown begins the moment you cast, so it's really only a 15 second cooldown. I'll be frank, I think the animation for the tether looks friggin' sweet. The tether lasts for 10 seconds or will automatically break if your enemy gets 15 meters apart from you. The tether will remain even if line of sight is broken by a wall or a fence, which is pretty cool because you can track your targets then. The tether is also a projectile with an interesting design. A sword and shield player can't block the tether, but a great axe maelstrom can destroy the tether if timed perfectly. While you can only apply one tether, a single target can receive multiple tethers from multiple sources and the effects will stack. I had three people attach three different tethers at the same time and I received the max cap of a 50% weaken. This means that you and your friends can now go into outpost rushes and torment other people with triple tether. Unless, of course, you're not in one of the 10 servers that have big enough populations to even do outpost rush. Yikes. The first upgrade is Tethered Refresh. When you hit your tethered enemy, gain 5% cooldown reduction per hit. This cooldown reduction does not apply to tether's own cooldown because reasons. The second upgrade is Tethered Focus. Gain 100% mana regen during the 10 seconds your tether is up. The third upgrade is Soul Eater. Get an 80% weapon damage heal when you kill a tethered target. Since tether is designed for either 1v1s or boss fights, getting a crappy heal after the fight is already over has basically no value. Also, as always, Amazon is lying harder than when your girl says she's fine. This scales exclusively off of weapon damage, not focus. 
On to the third and final ability, Essence Rupture. Shoot a small projectile that creates a unique debuff on the enemy. This debuff lasts for 10 seconds, and anyone who hits that enemy will get healed for 20% of the damage they do. Note, this is not healing for 20% of your weapon damage. This is healing for 20% of the damage your allies are pumping out. So the harder they hit, the bigger they get healed. This costs 25 mana and sits on a 20 second cooldown. Since this is a debuff that gets applied, this healing will affect anyone hitting the target, even different colored people. Yellows can literally heal purples. Greens can heal purples. Purples can even heal purples. It's a crazy new world we live in. The first upgrade is Invigorating Rupture. On top of health, anyone that hits a ruptured target will gain 15 stamina on hit. Now imagine a rapier player hitting a ruptured target. Pretty freaking nutty and again, really helps your tank out with their stamina control. The second upgrade is Overflowing Essence. When Essence Rupture ends, any allies within 4 meters of the target get healed for 80% of your weapon damage. This is a nice little health boost to anyone nearby, but I gotta talk about how bugged out this upgrade is because this is still in the game. If you duel somebody and you kill them while Essence Rupture is on them, then as soon as the duel technically ends, a gigantic damage burst pops from the target and this damage occurs after the duel. So this is real health that gets lost or even real down states that proc. So what might the practical applications for this bug be? Well, do you know of any bots who are constantly farming your favorite fishing spots, mining spots, or maybe even lumbering locations? Do you have a buddy who might be willing to duel you? Try losing next to them a few times and see how quickly the botting farms get ruined. Also, don't think I would miss this opportunity to tell you that this ability scales exclusively with focus about as much as Tiger Woods exclusively sleeps with his wife. Abilities done, let's move on to the passives. First up, Deadly Range. Deal 10% increased damage on heavy attacks on targets more than 8 meters away from you. Fervent Thirst. Gain 5% mana when you ranged light attack a target that has a Void Gauntlet debuff on them. Since your light attacks cost 2 mana, you're really only netting 3 mana. Radiant Efficiency. All your mana costs are reduced by 25% when your mana is over 50%. This actually resulted in a weird effect where my light attacks would alternate between costing 1 mana and 2 mana, which means that clearly Amazon is doing further decimal calculations that don't actually show up on screen. And also, all your abilities cost a ton of mana, so this is really nice to have. Refreshing Harvest. Gain 10% cooldown reduction when doing Harvest Essence, which is that block mechanic. Leeching Bolts. Your ranged heavy attacks now have 50% life steal versus targets under 50% health. Yes, 50% life steal with one passive. But to be fair, people are rarely standing there ranged heavy attacking with Void Gauntlet because the DPS isn't great compared to Void Blade. Extended Suffering. Your ranged heavy attacks increase the duration of non crowd control debuffs that you apply by 10%. This increase will not affect your slows, stuns, or roots, but it will affect all the other debuffs. Unfortunately, you cannot extend your tether timer with this. The last passive is Mending Evasion. Dodging with full mana heals you for 80% weapon damage, and this has an internal cooldown of 20 seconds. This is just another nice little health boost that can help keep you topped off while traveling around the tournament. And also, this ability scaling exclusively with focus is as honest as the Streamer of the Year award that I totally have in my bedroom. Finally, we have the Decay Elite Glimpse of the Void. This has the exact same mechanics as the Annihilation Elite Void Caller. When you hit enemies with your abilities, you gain stacks of Void Essence. Once you reach 4 stacks, you can do 1 ranged heavy attack, and when it lands, you instantly reset all the cooldowns for your abilities. This sits on a 15 second internal cooldown, and all the stacks will get removed when the heavy attack lands. So now we have the power to reset our abilities before they've even finished proccing, so let's go through and talk about each ability that has potential for some fun. Oblivion Circles cannot and will not stack, so don't cast your second one until the first one is done. Petrifying Scream can be used back to back for essentially a 6 second route when done properly. Orb of Protection damage will occur twice and the debuffs will stack, but the healing you receive will not stack. You cannot have two tethers at the same time, so when you cast the second tether, your first tether disappears. 
Essence ruptures cannot stack, so reapplying will just reset the debuff timer to 10 seconds. This is a really fun elite, but it was so extremely bugged in the craziest way, and this bug has remained in the game until the December patch. Glimpse of the Void has a 15 second internal cooldown, but if you weapon swap and then weapon swap back, the internal cooldown reset. This means that as long as you double weapon swapped, you could constantly just use your abilities over and over and over and over again, and the only thing stopping you was mana. This bug also exists for Void Caller, but that one is a lot harder to constantly take advantage of because it doesn't reset your abilities and you need to do ability hits to actually gain your procs. Now thankfully, Amazon has finally realized how insane this is and is patching it in the December patch, but let's be honest, there's a strong likelihood we find a bug or a problem like this again, so I'm just doing my job and letting you guys know about it. That wraps up the decay tree. To recap, your balls hurt enemies and make allies feel good. You can put enemies on a leash. You can get a 50% lifesteal on heavies. And your elite lets you reset all your ability cooldowns. Now, normally we would jump straight into builds, but I want to take a sec to talk about weapon perks because these are super huge and impactful in New World and they really affect how our builds run and function. Um, a lot of these weapon perks, the numbers attached to them are different depending on the gear level of, you know, the item and whatnot. So I'm just going to talk about them more on a broad general aspect. First up, Vericious Blade. When you're below 50% health, gain a large amount of lifesteal. This is on top of all the lifesteal that you can get for bat crits for a grand total of around 60% lifesteal on each hit. Which is absurd because that doesn't even account for leeching perks. Next is even crazier. Nullifying Oblivion. Remove all buffs from any enemy on activation that are within Oblivion range. This is currently being used to absolutely nuke people, and the way that Sacred Ground and Beacon work is that they apply a heal over time buff. So when Nullifying Oblivion gets cast on healing circles, it completely gets rid of any and all healing from the circles. This was so powerful that it was even removing food and utility buffs, but thankfully, that was a bug and it's been removed, so I'm sure we're going to see it again in January. But wait, there's more. Void Gauntlet can do everything you want except one thing. Apply disease. Well, look no further because we have Putrefying Scream, so that your scream now applies a fat disease on targets for 10 seconds. Initially, this could max at a 50% disease, which is a 50% reduction to healing, but Amazon has decided to tone that down a little bit to a 30% disease at max in the December patch. Let's move to the decay tree. First is diminishing orb. When you hit enemies with your orb, reduce the duration of the buffs on them by a lot. People not standing close enough for you to remove their buffs with oblivion? No worries, just orb them instead. Next is Baleful Tether. This slows your tethered target by 20-30% to 30 for 3 seconds. This is actually really reasonable and not stupid overpowered, which means that in comparison, it's as strong as Hatchet Throwing Tree. Finally, we have Empowering Rupture. When killing your target that has Essence Rupture, get a very small empower for a very small amount of time, which begs the question, what was Amazon smoking? Who would want this, and when would this be viable? Who is playing Essence Rupture for the value that we get after the target is dead? The Annihilation Weapon Perks are over here with the power of the Infinity Gauntlet to warp time and space around your buff bar, and Jerry is over here giving Essence Rupture the mighty power of Hawkeye! As always, there are a plethora of different ways to play New World that require different builds to focus on different roles, so we're going to start with my recommendations for playing the game solo open world, then partied open world, then expeditions, then 1v1 builds, then 50v50 war, then finally, the one build to rule them all for if you want to do everything but don't want to constantly change your build like me. Now, I'm very aware that there are two styles to the Void Gauntlet. One is the offhand for a healer, and the second is a damage dealer, and my recommendations will shift depending on the playstyle, so let's dive right in. First up, Solo Open World. Here, I'll be recommending Void Blade, Oblivion, Orb of Decay, and Void Caller. 
Void Blade and Oblivion are simply must-haves. Your damage skyrockets while holding the blade and fighting on top of Oblivion feels like you're cheating with how hard you win. Plus, anytime you run these two abilities, you can use your slip and slide to traverse a turnum in the fastest way possible. Since we're already taking 7 points in Annihilation from abilities, and we for sure want some of those nice passives, we're going to be rocking Void Caller as our elite, which will give us some nice damage and sustain, which is what the Void Gauntlet's all about. On the Decay side, we're going to be taking Orb, but not fully upgrading it. This will be our one ranged ability, and it does alright damage, but we're really more interested in the heal that we'll constantly apply to ourselves. Since we care more about the heal on the bounce back, that means that we really don't care too much about trying to grab the detonation upgrade, and slowing PvE adds doesn't really matter, so we can take those points and put them into some passives that are going to be more impactful, like increased lifesteal on heavy, and decreased mana costs. Overall, the build is simple. Aggro mobs, drop oblivion, shoot orb, pull out your sword, and whack away. Mobs will melt, your health will go right back up to full, and it's like nothing ever happened to you. For weapon pairings, the Void Gauntlet was clearly designed to go hand in hand with the Life Staff. Life Staff plus Void Gauntlet is easily the best healing in the game, and since Void Gauntlet has secondary scaling off focus, you can just run full focus builds for huge heals and huge damage. Just drop your healing circles on top of Oblivion and shrug everything off. This build also completely gets rid of your need for health or regen pots, which is going to save you a ton of money and resources. Other options for weapon pairings would be the Fire Staff or the Ice Gauntlet. Frankly, the Void Gauntlet for damage really hinges on whether your Void Blade is active or not, and because of this, I really view Void Gauntlets as melee weapons. Since Void Gauntlet has primary scaling off intelligence, it naturally pairs really well with the Fire Staff or the Ice Gauntlet, which can mainly be used as your ranged options. Fire Staff has solid AoE and amazing damage from range, so you can whittle away enemies, then pop Void Gauntlet once adds have closed the distance to you. Another huge perk is that the Slip and Slide plus Burnout is literally the most mobility currently in the game, so you can zoom around the map at will. The Ice Gauntlet also has some solid AoE, and you can do some really creative combos where you can root enemies with a the Scream, then Ice Shower them for guaranteed root with Frostbite. Both of these are more oriented for dealing large amounts of damage as opposed to the Life Staff, which is much more sustain based. Next, you got a couple buddies and you're roaming around to turn them together for partied open world. This first build I'm showing is for when you're the primary healer of the group and just looking to keep everyone alive. We're bringing Oblivion because it gives your allies a 20% damage increase and that's absolutely insane and we're literally always going to bring this ability. This time, we have Orb of Decay fully upgraded, and that's because we care much more about what the healing orb can provide. Our goal with the orb is to get the return healing orb to hit as many allies as possible, then immediately pop the explosion so they get both the heal over time and the instant heal on burst. Finally, I think Essence Rupture is incredibly valuable, especially when fighting larger creatures. It also allows your allies to heal themselves with their own damage for those friends that just refuse to stand in your green circles. Since we already have 7 points in Decay, and we want some of those nice mana and cooldown reduction passives, we're going to be taking Glimpse of the Void so that we can get another free round of abilities off without needing to wait on long cooldowns. This build is focused on providing the most amount of healing possible and having the shortest cooldowns possible. If you aren't the main heals in your group and you're more focused on damage with the Void Gauntlet, then I'd recommend the same build as Solo Open World because that build is just all about damage. For weapon pairings, if you're the main healer, then your other weapon needs to be the Life Staff. Just mash your face on the keyboard until all your abilities have been pressed, then swap to the Void Gauntlet and mash your face on the keyboard some more. The Life Staff and the Void Gauntlet pair so extremely well with each other because you can get low on mana dumping out heals, then use the Void Gauntlet to steal your own life and top your mana back off so you can keep dumping the heals out for a nice really fun cycle. If you aren't the main healer, but you just want to do damage with a Void Gauntlet, then I'd again recommend the Fire Staff or the Ice Gauntlet and run that solo open world build. Use the Void Gauntlet once enemies are within melee range, and use Fire or Ice whenever enemies are at range. Next up, Expeditions, which are 5 man instance dungeons. This is going to be extremely simple because my build recommendation as healer will be the exact same as Partied Open World. If you're the main healer, rock that fully upgraded orb and essence rupture and just pump heals throughout the entire run. Now if you're coming in as a DPS, I'm still absolutely recommending Void Blade and Oblivion because those are mandatory, but 
I think you're going to get the most value out of Tether or Essence Rupture. I'm personally going to recommend Tether, especially for boss fights, as it's going to boost your DPS a lot and reduce the boss's DPS, which is going to help out your tanks a ton. If your healer is struggling or new, you can always run Essence Rupture to help out a little too, but play around with that third ability slot and just see what feels good different. For weapon pairings, I'd recommend the exact same three suspects. The Life Staff, the Fire Staff, and the Ice Gauntlet. The Life Staff is obviously for when you're the main healer, and the Fire and Ice are for when you're joining as DPS. Moving on to PvP and into the 1v1s. I think the best 1v1 build is almost entirely the Annihilation Tree. Bring the Blade, bring the Death Circle, bring the Scream. Root your enemies, drop the Oblivion, whack away to your heart's content. There is not a single melee class that can even come close to out DPSing your Void Blade when you're standing on Oblivion and your Scream guarantees that they're stuck on it. I will say that this build is extremely dependent on two things. First, your Void Blade cooldown. If Void Blade isn't up, don't use the Void Gauntlet. You will simply lose like every trade. Second, you have to land that scream. If you don't land the scream, you have no chase or catch potential to lock anyone down and make them fight you on Oblivion. But this is a perfect segue to weapon pairings. For weapon pairings, as always, we have the usual suspects in the Life Staff, the Fire Staff, and the Ice Gauntlet. There is basically nothing in this game right now that can kill a heavy armor, life staff, void gauntlet user. The heals are too insane, the damage is too crazy. The only possible counter is a bow or musket that just constantly pops headshots over and over and over and over again, but any smart player is just going to use terrain to break line of sight. So, if you want to play the most broken 1v1 build currently in New World, run the life staff with the void gauntlet. You're not killing people in the blink of an eye, it's going to take a couple blinks, but you're just never going to die. The Fire Staff is actually a really fun combo for 1v1s, because a really good and accurate Fire Staff user can win most ranged matchups, and melees need to spend a lot of time or health to gap close to you, and then once the fight actually turns melee, you can just whip that blade out and nuke the target on sight. For the Ice Gauntlet, it's got that similar playstyle as the Fire Staff, but the Ice Gauntlet can combo really well off the Scream as well with an Ice Shower into an Ice Spike sort of deal. Ice Gauntlet will give more room for zoning and controlling the battle, while Fire Staff gives more of that big range damage feel. Now, those were the usual suspects, but I'm going to recommend two more for the 1v1s. The Great Axe and the Sword and Shield. The Void Blade has no chase potential, and it's only lockdown is Scream, so let's pair it with the best chase and lockdown weapon in the game, the Great Axe. Charge, Gravity Well, Reap, Bloodlust, let those get you in range to pop that fat Void Gauntlet combo to wipe your enemy's health bar off the map. If you can get Gravity Well to land, you can guarantee the Scream, and that guarantees the rest of the combo. The last recommendation is Sword and Shield. The hands down best stun ability in the game is Shield Bash. It's an extremely fast animation and it gives you a little tiny iframe and it gives three second stuns. The best part is Oblivion's damage over time doesn't remove the stun from targets. So you can land a Shield Bash, then drop Oblivion before you scream to get an extra second of DPSing down the target. Insane Sword and Shield players like Snorlax can use the kit to block any and all ranged damage as well, so you're never going to lose health while gap closing. By the way, feel free to watch Snorlax in any of my 1v1 tournaments on YouTube if you want to learn these Sith powers. Next up are 50v50 Wars, and I could not be more torn on which build I like more. No matter what, you're always bringing Oblivion. I would also argue that Void Blade is a must-have as well. It gives you the slip and slide to get out of bad situations, and more importantly, when a bruiser is focusing you, you can just turn the fight on him, because you're going to outdamage him, even in a focus build. Shoot, you can probably win most 1v2s with Void Blade and Oblivion. That leaves the final slot, and I'm extremely torn between Scream and Orb of Decay, so I'll say this. If you're a DPS player, run the 1v1 build with Scream and help CC chain and lock down enemies for big wombo combos. If you have the weapon perks, you're also going to be applying a fat disease on enemies caught and you're going to remove all their buffs with Oblivion so your allies can absolutely nuke whoever you catch out. Now if you're the healer, run Orb of Decay and fully upgrade that bad boy so that you can do the heal pass through into the heal detonate on your boys. 
Frankly, if you pop Void Blade and the Bruiser's hitting you scatter to the wind, then you can always just go right back to healing your boys up without needing to worry about screaming and locking anybody down. For weapon pairings, I'll just be recommending the usual three. Life Staff, Fire Staff, and Ice Gauntlet. I've already extensively covered the pros and cons of each weapon and how they pair up, so let's move right along to the final build. Now you guys are like me. You love New World despite the constant dumpster fires that Jerry at Amazon keeps lighting, and you want to run all the content, but you don't want to constantly change your build around for each aspect of the game. Well, look no further because I present to you the one build to rule them all. This build is extremely similar to our solo open world and war healing builds, but instead of taking one or three upgrades on orbit protection, I'm recommending only taking two. I think Scream, Tether, and Essence Rupture are great abilities that can thrive under certain circumstances, but I think Orb of Decay just thrives in more scenarios and can provide great value no matter what content you're running. Since this is a build we're considering for PvP content as well, I wanted to include the big slow application on Orb this time to help kite or lock down. The vast majority of the value that we get from Orb comes from the heal over time from the bounce back and we're much less concerned about the detonating for damage or heal bursts. I'd rather put those points into increasing our damage or mana regen. So what should we pair with this monster power creep weapon? I gotta recommend either the life staff or the fire staff. If you're a healer, the life staff plus void gauntlet is just currently busted in all content. You're quite literally becoming unkillable while still being able to output more melee DPS than any other weapon in the game because somehow that's balanced. On top of never dying, you're going to save thousands and thousands of gold because you just won't be using health or regen potions. And I don't know about you guys, but those are going for 15 gold a pop on my server. If you don't want to play a healer and want more of that DPS style of gameplay though, then I totally recommend the Fire Staff. I think the Fire Staff excels at range and deals amazing AoE damage with Fireball, Burnout, Incinerate, and maybe one day Flamethrower will get grit, but that's a pipe dream for another video. You can chunk everything with Fire Staff, and once people have burned their gap closers just to get in range of you, pop the Void Gauntlet combo and slaughter everything in sight. No matter which style you choose, the Void Gauntlet is an incredibly versatile, high healing and high DPS and high buffing and high debuffing and high disease and high CC and high life steal and high cooldown reduction and high buff removal and high weaken uh, and high rend weapon. And whichever Jerry designed this overpower monster must have been high on the trifecta when they balanced it compared to other weapons. That's going to wrap up the Void Gauntlet, everybody. As always, huge shout out to my brother Michael, to Son of a Pritch I'm In, to Balls Deep, and to Slim of Q. Thank you so much, boys, for helping me out with all the testing. You guys were the best dummies a man could have asked for. And I just thank you guys. Um, for everybody watching, if you want to help support me, support the channel, support the video, you guys can always drop a like on it. You can leave a comment below. That's really, really helpful for the YouTube algorithms. Or you could always sub to me as well. And that's also a really free way that you can help me out as a content creator. Um, as always, guys, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.